Good evening, everyone. My name is Vasilis Pranagis, and I have a special guest tonight with me, Mr. Jeremy Corpin. Welcome to Helen TV. How are you? Very nice to see you, and thank you so much for inviting me here. It's very it's nice like to see you. Like old times in back in Wood Green. <laughs> Lovely. It's very nice to see you, and um, you know I'm very happy to have you here and uh, talk about uh, you and uh, your uh, uh, relationship with uh, our community. It's so many years. We know that uh, you love uh, our Cypriot uh, compatriots and you're helping us a lot. And uh, shall we go back a few years and talk to us about your first, um, you know, word, like um, how you decide to become a counselor and involved in politics? I need to go back to uh, how many a long years? time, 1973. I was, Just before um, the invasion in Cyprus. Indeed. Yeah. I was then the uh, agent mm -hmm. for Hornsey Labour Party and um, I was campaign worker and so on. And we then had the February 74 general election, which um, we fought a strong campaign in Hornsey and got the uh, majority down quite a lot, but we didn't win the seat. I was then um, elected to Haringey Council in May 74 for South Hornsey Ward, which covered uh, part of Green Lanes, part of Haringey Ladder, and South Hornsey around Stroud Green. And um, then in July, the invasion happened. And um, Haringey Council um, did all it could to um, welcome the Cypriot refugees that they, came. They, they helped them a lot. A, yes, a lot, a great deal. And uh, the Labour group meetings were very dominated by the issue and large numbers of um, Cypriot people came and moved into Haringey Ward because there was already uh, quite a big Cypriot community all along Green Lanes. I remember all those cafes. They'd been there for some time. John Sophocle and others had those cafes. You might even remember yeah, them. Yeah. I used to go to his cafe quite a lot. And um, then I was a councillor and then elected as agent again for uh, Haunty Labour Party and was the agent in the October general election when Harold Wilson came to speak. And the he was then Prime Minister. He came very late and then I asked to have a few minutes with him before the rally and uh, he said, um, what do you want? He was very polite. Yeah. And I said, I want to give you a briefing before the event. And he said, what about? I said, Cyprus. He said, why? I said, well, there's a... Um, very large number of Cypriot refugees have made their homes in our borough and they're very welcome and we're doing all they can to support them but they're very angry and they want to hear from you what you're doing to condemn support the them. invasion mm -hmm. and the uh, yeah. partition of Cyprus. Anyway, uh, Harold um, made his speech, goes on through it and he, he was reading this speech and it, it was all right, I suppose, but, you know, not exciting. And then the Cypriot community, wow, rose up and said, what about Cyprus? To his credit, he then closed the book of his speech and just took repartee. Yeah. It was almost like a Q&A. Uh -huh. well, some of it was very witty, because he was a very clever, very witty yeah, yeah. guy. But I think he then began to understand the passion of it. And so that was at that meeting. And then... Um, I became very involved in supporting um, the Cypriot community to come to live here. Many had lost everything, lost their homes, everything. Yeah, like me, for example. Very yeah. poor, yeah. like yourself. They yeah. came with nothing. And you must remember it, an awful lot of families relied on home working in order to survive. Mm -hmm. So they'd have a sewing machine in the kitchen and they would be running up dresses and so on, which were then sold in Fontill Road and other places. There was big Cypriot diverse clothing industry. And then I got very annoyed with our planning department because Haringey Planning said they shouldn't be using these big sewing machines in the houses. They must apply for planning permission oh. and then they would be rejected. The idea being to shut the industry down. I said, wait, 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 wait. This is wrong. And they're mostly women. These women are doing this work but they've got no alternative. Exactly. Absolutely no alternative. And so I said, let's stop this nonsense. 
And I had a big argument with the council, big argument with the Labour group, and I persuaded them to set up the Home Working Working Party mm -hmm. for home working and for children. And what we got out of it was a change in the policy, quarter horsepower um, sewing machines were allowed, nursery facilities were provided, particularly in Haringey Ladder Green Lanes area, and we began to have a completely different approach of supporting the women workers, supporting what they were trying to do, and building the strength of the community. And then later on, I was um, also chair of community development, and um, the late Bernie Grant and myself managed to swing the spending so that we could develop a Cypriot centre. We tried it to be the church, uh, on uh, Haringey Ladder, we didn't get that, and so instead we uh, took over the old school at St Angela's, which is now the Cypriot Centre. And every time I go there, I'm just so proud of all those arguments we had to get the Cypriot Centre. That was my involvement from the very beginning, and then when I became an MP, obviously I have been with the Cypriot group in Parliament, demanding the reification that Britain adhere to its responsibilities as a guarantor power in 1960 and helps to bring about the reunification of Cyprus. We are on the 50th anniversary and I just feel very mixed emotions. I'm sure you have the same. One is huge um, congratulations and pride in the achievements of the Cypriot community and the huge contribution you've made to life in North London but also desperate sadness that your country is still divided. Same, yeah. And then the referendum that was held, the um, plan, the Anand plan, which was uh, rejected, and we ended up with what we've got now, yeah. which I hope there can be renewal of negotiations. And as a member of the Council of Europe, I'm obviously supportive of negotiations and of reunification. Okay. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Corbyn, why you decided to be an independent candidate. I mean, what was the main, your main, uh, you know, like um, uh, challengers? As you know, um, I stepped down as leader of the Labour Party in um, April 2020. I was suspended from Labour Party membership very briefly in October 2020 reinstated unanimously by the panel and the National Executive. And then um, Keir Starmer decided that I should not be a member of the Parliamentary Labour Party. And I was uh, suspended as a member of the Parliamentary Labour Party and therefore in parliamentary terms declared to be an independent MP. And then the arguments went on. He made an agreement with Len McCluskey and others that I could be reinstated into the party. He then changed his mind, having made the agreement. And after that, Len McCluskey got very angry with him, and rightly so, because he had been uh, shortchanged. And uh, I was then um, continued as an independent MP, and he, Starmer that is, moved a resolution at the National Executive saying that I was not eligible to be a Labour candidate. Yeah. I've been an MP since 1983. Yeah. To say I'm not eligible to be a Labour candidate made a lot of people in Islington very, very angry. They tried very hard to get me reinstated into the Parliamentary Party. That was unsuccessful. And um, then the selection came, eventually, for a candidate for Islington North. The local party were completely excluded from it. And um, initially, two people were nominated to be on the shortlist. Um, I wrote to the party and said two things. One is, where there's a sitting MP, there should be what they call a trigger ballot, where they decide whether to proceed with the full selection or just uh, allow the current MP to continue. Um, and I wish my name to be considered. Mm -hmm. I got a letter from David Evans, the General Secretary, saying, you can't be considered because you're not eligible. I wrote back and said, I don't agree with this. I wish to appeal the decision. He said, there's no right of appeal because the rules of natural justice don't apply. You're out. Mm. A lot of people were very, very angry about this. I know. And wrote to me, sent me a petition saying, run as an independent. I obviously thought very hard about it, big decision. Decided to do so just over three weeks ago. And in three weeks, we formed a campaign. 
We've covered the whole constituency by leafleting and by canvassing and public meetings. I've held lots of public meetings. I'm open to questions, debate, and so on and so on. Sadly, the imposed Labour candidate refuses to debate, refuses to attend um, any hustings events, and um, is refusing even interviews with the local papers. Mm -hmm. But I'm here. It'll be the same me. In Parliament, I'll be speaking up on all the issues I've always spoken about, and um, I will be proud to represent the people of Islington North again. Uh, do you think there are many, uh, you know, uh, possible voters uh, in the Labour Party? They're going to vote for you? Yes. Yeah, they, they... I'm absolutely sure of it, because they keep stopping me on the street and saying, I know, obviously know them. They're Labour Party members, and they sort of come and look around like this and say, yeah, I'm, I'm voting for you. Okay. They yeah. don't have to say that. They come and tell me. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Corbyn, um, NHS is suffering. What are you going to do? The NHS is suffering because of privatisation. It's suffering because there's not enough money within the NHS. And it's suffering because the private finance initiative takes money out of the hospital. 15% of hospital income goes out. Lloyds Bank is suing the Whittington Hospital because they didn't make enough money out of the private finance initiative. And uh, many of the services are now rationed, so the private sector takes over. So those that can afford it, for example, get fertility treatment. Those that can't, don't get it. Well, what I'm going to do is be demanding proper funding for the NHS, an end to the whole PFI system, and also the issues of social care because uh, you go into the Whittington or indeed any other hospital, you'll find quite a lot of often very frail, very elderly people in hospital for an excessive amount of time. Not because they need to be in hospital, but because they need social care mm -hmm. and it's not available. We're relying on uh, the private sector to provide social care. It can't and it won't. We have to have the same bold approach now that the after the Second World War, the Labour government, particularly in Arun Bevan, who was the health secretary, had to set up a national health service. We need a national care service, and that's what I'll be campaigning for. Okay, now, um, crime, I mean, especially in North London, I mean, where I live, Wood Green, all this kind of thing, I can see so many things happening and so much, you know, uh, trouble with, um, you know, in the streets and all this kind of thing. Yeah. What are you going to do about that, I mean, to change the situation? My part of North London, Finsbury Park, um, Holloway Road, Archway, Highbury, is not that different to yeah. Green Lanes, to Bounds Green, to Turnpike Lane. It's not, that, it's it's not that different. Um, there has to be a lot, of, a lot of things done differently. One is community policing is important and neighbourhood police groups which are totally focused on one ward. Ken Livingstone brought this in when he was the mayor first time, had a big effect. That means you've got a police presence. And you've then got the ability to try and chase down particularly knife crime. Secondly, trying to educate a whole population to not carry knives. Um, a good friend of mine is a wonderful woman called Jessica Plummer, whose son, Shakwa Sami Plummer, died from a knife crime. And she spent all the years since he died, more than 10 years, campaigning about knife crime. And so that's educating people. But it's also about looking at the way in which young people, and they're mostly young, get involved in knife crime because they some or other think it's clever to carry a knife. They some or other feel that they have no alternative in life. And we don't have enough youth clubs, youth facilities, and support for young people. That has to be part of it. And so crime is a product of a lot of things, not exclusive, but including poverty as well. And um, we also just got to face it, when people have committed serious crimes and they're convicted, they go to prison. Okay. When they come out of prison, I would like to think that everyone that's been to prison will have had their life studied by the prison service, will have received an education when they're in prison, and will come out with a skill so they can work, yeah. so they can contribute to society. We are failing abysmally, particularly in the Young Offenders Institute. Mm -hmm. You'll be shocked at this, 80% 
of young people that come out of Young Offenders Institute they don't know go on to commit crime again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we can do it differently. Yeah. I've been in Denmark, I've been in Norway, I've studied the prison systems in those countries, very, very different, and they're very low reoffending rate. So education has to be in prison, has to be, you know, yeah. uh, everywhere. How yeah. can you uh, promote this and, you know, uh, how you can expand the education through youth clubs and all this kind of thing? Uh, are there in, any, uh, you know, facilities available? For there that? are facilities. Islington particularly has uh, kept its community centres, particularly in the north of the borough where I am. And we do have... Uh, detached youth workers and some uh, youth clubs. We need more, but there is, there is a basis there. But you're right about the question of education in the prisons and the Young Offenders Institutes, that the, the prison education system is the lowest priority for the prison service. Whenever there's a staff shortage or an incident in a prison, it's always education that's closed down first. It's the least priority. My view, education of prisoners and giving them qualifications and giving them some sense of responsibility and hope is absolutely key way forward. I used to be a member of the Select Committee on Justice in Parliament and did a lot of prison visiting. In some cases, I remember going to Wakefield Prison and uh, Doncaster Prisons. I was actually quite impressed by the education system they're running there. Yeah. Others I went to, I was not impressed in the slightest. Yeah. Now, Mr. Coppin, there is, we're going to uh, Cyprus issue. There is 50 years now, invasion in Cyprus, and nothing happened. I mean, the same situation, and, the, you know, the negotiations stops. What are you uh, thinking about? What plans do you have if you be elected? How you can deal with this uh, issue? Well, Cyprus is a small island. You know that better than me. And uh, it has two dominant languages, Greek and Turkish, and it, we suffered the invasion in 1974 and the partition of Cyprus. And we also have the issue of the city of Famagusta. We'll come on to that in a moment. The Maya view is there has to be a, um, a bicommunal future, a future where Turkish and Greek languages are equally respected and both communities are able to work and live together. We got somewhere towards that with the Anand Plan, but it had some fundamental flaws in it. The Anand Plan was, as you know, supported by the north of Cyprus and rejected by the south, whereas it was kind of counterintuitive, but historically I would have expected it to be the other way around, but that was the result. And the result was brought about because many in the south felt they'd lost land and homes and property and hope in the north and they should be compensated for it or at least allowed to go back. That didn't happen and that was the failing of it. So really it is up to Britain as a guarantor power because Britain in 1960 independence of Cyprus was a guarantor of Cypriot independence. What leading role has any British government ever taken on Cyprus? Answer, you know better than me, very, yes. very little. And so in, the, uh, in Parliament I will be that person demanding that Britain because it has this special responsibility, You're going to ask takes a lead in that. And also recognizing the UN resolution on Famagusta and indeed the decision that's likely to come this week at the Council of Europe, which I'm a member of, but obviously cannot be there in Strasbourg this week for reasons you'll understand, um, passes, which at least recognizes the fact that Famagusta population was removed, largely Greek population, in the 1970s, scattered all over Cyprus, indeed all over the world, particularly London, um, they deserve their right of return. Yeah. Now, um, what is your message, the main message to our uh, audience, especially the Cypriot community and the Greek community, as well as everyone who is listening to us? Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I want to say a big thank you to all of you for watching this program this evening and for the huge achievements of the Cypriot community in London. I just remember people coming to London in the 1970s, desperate, but actually weren't asking for very much. All they asked for was the chance 
the chance to succeed in this community. Yeah. And that was what was so impressive about it. And um, the businesses that have been opened, the work that's been done, the supplementary schooling that's been done, the maintenance of that brilliant Cypriot culture, the food, the language, the dance, the music, and of course the um, sense of enterprise, the community, is something that I think we can all be very, very proud of. And North London is a big bit of Cyprus, really, isn't it? <laughs> There's a lot of Cypriots all over North London. Yeah, it's and half uh, Cyprus is here. Yeah, indeed. That's what I remember one of the previous um, presidents um, visited here. He came to the Cypriot Centre and he was very polite and said, yeah, 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 indeed. Yeah. And he said to me, um, he said, you represent more Cypriots than I do. <laughs> <laughs> you were right. <laughs> so he was probably right <laughs> at that. that. So I want to say well done and thank you. I know the 50th anniversary is a bittersweet moment because we do remember the hardship and the horrors but also the huge achievements of the community of never giving up, never disappearing and never going away. This election is about Cyprus, but it's also about our health service and in my case in Islington, about giving hope to people of the kind of world we could live in. I'm standing for democracy. I'm standing for peace. I'm standing for social justice. And uh, obviously if I'm re-elected, I'll carry on doing all of that and I'm very grateful for all that I've been able to learn from the Cypriot community, from being a councillor in the 1970s to an MP in the 80s onwards. I've learned a great deal. So thank you very much for listening to our discussion this evening and thank you so much for having me on the programme. Thank you, it's Mr. Been an absolute Coffin. pleasure. It, it, it's been a pleasure to have you here and um, I wish your, um, you know, uh, dreams and your um, thoughts go through to their minds and do the best. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστούμε και εσάς. Thank you very much and uh, have a good night.